Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is entitled Dyslexia, Supporting Struggling Readers. Our presenter today is Katie Kasabuski. Katie is a dyslexia practitioner at the Madison Children's Dyslexia Center and the state lead for Decoding with, uh, Dyslexia Wisconsin. It is my pleasure today to introduce to you Katie Kasabuski. Katie? Hi, thank you, Bonnie. Sorry for that beeping earlier. My weather alarm went off, so. <laughs> thank you for having me here today. Uh, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. and this photo here is from our rally that we had last month, or sorry, last um, last October at the state capitol. And this photo says it all for us at Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin. I should not have to fight for my right to learn to read. Sorry, I'm trying to flip slides. Here we go. Um, a little bit about me. I was trained at the Children's Dyslexia Center after realizing that both of our children have dyslexia. So I'm currently a certified academic language practitioner, CULP, um, and also the state lead for Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin as of last year. A little bit about the things I enjoy, coffee, reading, knitting, and board games with our family. An overview of our presentation today. Um, I'll cover topics about what is decoding dyslexia Wisconsin, who we are, defining dyslexia, dyslexia myths, literacy um, equity in Wisconsin, how science says that we read, how um, strong readers learn to read, what to look for in early childhood, elementary and high school and how to support these learners. Um, what are, a, a, uh, sorry, what are the effective components of literacy instruction? Also a little bit about um, assistive technology and our Wisconsin Dyslexia Guidebook, which passed uh, this winter and was signed into law in February. So Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin is a national and international organization. We have over 50 chapters. Um, the photo to the left here is of our Madison group. We usually meet in coffee, coffee shops and we just kind of have a relaxing chat to support each other. Um, during these trying times with COVID, <laughs> it's been more difficult to meet, unfortunately. Um, but we are trying to meet online more regularly and we've revamped our website. So if you haven't been to decodingdyslexiawisconsin.org, we have a, an updated website to try to make contacting us um, easier. And we also do a lot of legislative activities. Uh, last year we had a rally at the Capitol in October and that photo on the bottom is members that came to the Capitol. What is dyslexia? So I'm going to read this. I know that people may have heard it in the past, but dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. So this definition was taken from the International Dyslexia Association and it's pretty lengthy. So what does that mean? It means that 
dyslexia, dyslexia is an unexpected condition. So these students have, um, you know, they, if you were in the classroom, they would seem like typical students. But when they go to read or write, they have, they have quite a bit of difficulty. Is dyslexia rare? So I took enrollment from last year, you can see off to the side, 2019-2020 enrollment um, was approximately 854,959 students in Wisconsin. Dyslexia is prevalent in approximately 10 to 20% of the population. The National Institutes of Health estimates about 17%. So if you look just at Wisconsin students from last year's enrollment, that dyslexia would impact approximately 85,000 to 170,000 students, which is quite, quite a big chunk of students. Also, if you look over to the side on the right under demographics, students with disabilities, interestingly enough, in Wisconsin are about 14%. And that 14% is right in line with the national average of students identified with disability by state. Some myths about dyslexia. Again, dyslexia is not rare. Roughly 17% of the general population has dyslexia. A lot of people think that people with dyslexia see letters or words backwards. Um, that's not true. Think of a chair. So I should have found this image for you. It's a really great one. So if you take a chair and you flip it upside down, it's still a chair. If you flip it sideways again, it's still a chair. So imagine that with the letters B, D, and P. That's kind of what we're looking at with dyslexia. Because the letter is still the same shape, it's just in a different orientation. But it does, it's not a visual problem. Um, myth number three, reading more over the summer would help. So more of the same does not work. Children with dyslexia need intensive remediation, which we will talk about later. They need a specific type of intervention. And myth number four, the wait and see approach. Maybe they'll all grow it. So because dyslexia is neurobiological in nature, it's um, oftentimes hereditary. It, it could be caused by other things, but one does not simply outgrow dyslexia because it's something that you're born with and your brain just operates a little bit different. Okay, so reading as an equity issue. I don't know if if um, the people in the audience have had time to look at any of Emily Hanford's work. I would highly recommend it. I have a link there in the PowerPoint. Um, she did a, this is her summer, this summer report, but in 2019, she did a report on reading in schools, which really got people speaking about literacy instruction in the United States, and then also about dyslexia. So she started, publishing 2019, maybe before that. And Emily Hanford says, a false assumption about what it takes to be a skilled reader has created deep inequalities among US children, putting many on a difficult path in life. So I took um, this image from this article titled, What the Words Say. And the first, the first bar graph is um, students, so this is divided by race and ethnicity and black students scored lowest in that basic or below basic or i'm sorry the highest and they scored lowest in the blue the advanced and proficient as you can see so it, it kind of goes um by race and you can see that the first bar or the, the students that are black and then the white students are off to the right. So how does Wisconsin compare to nationally? I just brought this up because I thought it was an interesting way to present the graphics 
So this was um, how a AAPM reports presented the data. How does Wisconsin compare? So Wisconsin Reading Coalition has broken down the data for Wisconsin, the same data that Emily Hanford used in her report, the NAEP scores, National Assessment of Educational Progress. So interestingly, off to the right here, it says that Wisconsin closely mirrors national performance overall. But when we look at Wisconsin scores, we say headlines this, Wisconsin has the widest racial achievement gap on the nation's report card. The nation's report card is that, Na that NAEP score. And so Wisconsin Reading Coalition has broken down the data by race and ethnicity. And you can see here, Wisconsin Black students score quite, um, quite poorly compared to other groups. So, I mean, that could be a whole nother presentation of itself, but <laughs> I wanted everybody aware that Wisconsin Reading Coalition has broken down the data like this. So we can take a, you can take a further look at the website. Struggling reader. So we know that the test scores, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. So looking at Wisconsin's overall scores here, only 36%, according to this graph, graph are advanced or proficient, and 64 are basic or below basic. So who are these people, who are these students who are struggling? Who are these students who are in the black and red part of the graph? Those are the kids that we should be focusing on. This is a really great visual of the spectrum of reading. So we've got the top 5%, pretty much they don't need any instruction. They can just, you could just give them a book. They could just open up the book and they just start reading. It's pretty amazing. Then you have 35% of students approximately that they will be sitting in a general classroom and they seem to learn how to read relatively easily with very little instruction. Now we get down to the 40 to 50% of our students and then the 10 to 15%. So this 40 to 50% of our students is an interesting group because these students would learn to read fairly easily with explicit, systematic, and sequential instruction. So we've got this 5% here in the green plus the 35% in the green. That about equates to our 40% reading proficiency on the NAEP scores. So what, what does that say about reading instruction in Wisconsin? We could maybe, um, we could maybe assume that the 40% the that the reading instruction in Wisconsin helps those that don't need a lot of help to read. So what can we do to improve the students that need explicit direct help? And then we have the children with dyslexia. The children with dyslexia are gonna need even more repetitions and they need explicit, systematic, sequential instruction with many, many repetitions. So while I like this presentation is about dyslexia, the state of literacy in Wisconsin is at the point where we can't really talk about dyslexia unless we're also talking about general reading instruction because our NAEP scores have shown and other scores have shown that Wisconsin students and students across the country are not really reading at the levels they should be. Okay, so what does it mean if you have dyslexia? What does it mean if we have an IEP goal with 80% uh, accuracy? So this is a passage where 20% of the words have been crossed out. 
and maybe because when I first read this, I was tired, but <laughs> I was struggling so hard to read it that I didn't know what book it was from. So just take a, I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds here. Just try to read through it and see what you can glean from this passage that's missing 20% of the words. Okay, how was that? Sorry if I didn't give you enough time, but um, yeah, I think you can get the idea. Did anybody feel like that was fairly easy to comprehend? Did you feel frustrated? Do you think you were able to get any comprehension out of the passage where you could only read 20%? Now look at the same passage with 5% of the words taken out. Okay, so how was that for every for you? Did you feel more confident? Did you feel less frustrated? How do you think your comprehension of that passage um, came about? How do you do you feel like you were able to comprehend more? So students that are given texts that are at grade level but might not be at their reading level really struggle with comprehension um, because they're struggling to decode the words or they're skipping over words that are difficult for them when they have dyslexia. So Wisconsin has some great resources and one of the resources we have in our state is Dr. Sean Anthony Robinson and he wrote uh, Dr. Dyslexia Dude. There's two uh, graphic novels that he's published, and his goal is to inspire kids. And he he really wants us to meet kids where they're at and not let them get to this point that he got to in his novel or in his graphic novel. So here you can see the cover of his his first graphic novel. And I don't know if you can read the center part, but it says, Sean was being attacked from both anxiety and dyslexia. And that's so common for a lot of our students with dyslexia. I'm, oops, let's see. So if you go back to this passage, you can really feel like you can't get the work done. This passage is a little bit easier, but we wanna catch kids before they get to this point where they feel like they can't and they get frustrated and they don't want to read this and you know they'll they'll then do their avoidance when it comes to literacy and then they've also checked out from the class so that even if they aren't required to read things during that moment in class their anxiety might have taken over and they still can't keep up with their students in their class the other students in their class so we want to catch students before they get to this point so this is also another great graphic. I'm dyslexic. I scream and cry before every reading, before reading group every day. Rather than punishing me, will you teach me to read? So a lot of students um, with reading and writing struggles may act out and it may look like they have behavioral issues. Um, but let's think about this in this day and age which subjects do not require reading, which subjects do not require writing. I'm uh, With the shift to virtual education, instead of playing instruments for band, the band director may be requiring children to write reports, to do more music theory, 
Um, so what a child can or student can do in an area may have shifted because of online learning. And we need to think about how literacy and reading and writing skills can impact classes other than just our core subjects. So how can we prevent this from happening? How can we prevent frustration? We can teach children in a way that supports strong reading skills. So this is the podcast that I was talking about previously with Emily Hanford. It was last August and she broke this, um, this report, what's wrong with how schools teach reading. And she, after doing research, concluded that skilled readers don't scan words and sample from the graphic clues in an incidental way. Instead, they very quickly recognize a word as a sequence of letters. That's how good readers instantly know the difference between house and horse, for example. And I think that's a great, a great way of looking at it, house and horse. We, you're just one letter off. So, you know, when I ask my son why he didn't stop to sound out a word, he'll tell me, well, I looked at the beginning letter and I looked at the end letter and I figured it was this word, you know, and sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong, but skilled readers will take in all of the letters in house instantly, very quickly. Um, and some people have come to call that sight words. Now sight words aren't in this meaning your traditional fry words, learned words. Sight word would mean that you look at the word and you instantly know that that word says incidental, or you look at that word and you know that it says graphic. But it's just because your brain has put all of those letters and sounds together really quickly. That's how skilled readers do it. They still map all the letters to sounds in their head while they're reading. So what compo components are included in skilled reading? Oh, I should ask um, Bonnie, do we have any questions? Actually, I do have one question for you that actually is related to what you were just talking about, and that's um, a discussion of sight words. Is it your idea that um, parents of children who have been diagnosed with dyslexia should spend time um, learning words through a sight process? So that's an interesting question because if you're talking about if you're asking about what we could traditionally call sight words, like the fry words, the red words, the the said were, those types of words, a lot of those words can be explained if you if the sounds are explicit explicitly taught later. Some of them are high frequency words that if you have a struggling reader, you may just want to teach them that sound pattern or you may want to work on memorizing the words. Um, what we do at the Dys Dyslexia Center and what is recommended in multisensory learning is to do it in a multisensory way. So you may do some arm tapping, for example. You can start at the top and for the, you can tap it out, T-H-E, and then you slide your hand down your arm and say the. And then I also have them say it as they write it. So they are saying it and seeing the letters. T H E the T H E the. Um, but like with the word the, there's a reason that the E says a uh, because there's a schwa at the end. So a lot of these words are explainable if all of the sound patterns are taught. We may not have time to get to all of those sound patterns in a direct and explicit way before the student needs them to read. So I hope that answers your question. Well, I think that one of the discussions that this um, practitioner pr practitioner um, was discussing was um, basically, um, like for example, a, a dulce word list or a list that um, teachers can prepare. Um, is it is it 
an easier challenge to have children also begin to memorize certain words that might be helpful. Um, then they would be able to find out things via the use of that word in a context, for example. Yes, I mean, we do that also. I would break it into smaller chunks though. Maybe practice, if you have the Dolch list, I think that's broken into hundreds maybe, um, but I would break it into groups of 10 and I would have them practice those same 10 words or however many the student can handle, definitely. Because if you've got a student that's a visual learner, that's a really great way for them to learn those words. Yeah. Okay, thank on. you, That that's all I have right now. Okay, so what components go into skilled reading? We have Scarborough's rope here, which if you're unfamiliar, I wanna walk you through it. The strands at the bottom here, you can see they're very loosely woven. They're kind of just hanging there frayed at the top also. And then as you weave down the rope, they get tighter. So the bottom of the rope is phonological awareness, which would be syllables and phone names, decoding, alphabetical principle. To me, decoding is, is reading, you know, putting it together and reading out loud sight word recognition, familiar words, building up your, your word vocabulary, your word bank. And then the, some of these other language comprehension skills, background knowledge, vocabulary, language structure, how do sentences and words go together, semantics, meaning, you know, verbal reasoning, literacy knowledge, all of these things go together. Um, when students have dyslexia, they need more repetitions down in the word recognition because these, this is where they struggle. They struggle to hear syllables. They struggle to understand how sounds go together and, and are pulled apart. You know, a lot of these students might have speech issues, so they may be referred to speech, so they have a hard time either hearing the different sounds or producing the sounds. So we're not necessarily, I'm not advocating or saying that we should hang out in word recognition a lot, but we need to hang out down here where the students with dyslexia feel supported and they definitely need more repetitions than other students would need. So you can see as the rope, as the, as the skills build, the rope tightens and you go to increased automaticity and comprehension. Skilled readers become fluent. So fluency comes from both part of the comprehension and then the word recognition. So we need to make sure that um, any literacy program that we're using includes all of these components. And you can use all of these components even if your student's at a basic level. You can use background knowledge and vocabulary, and you can discuss these things verbally, even if the student is struggling to decode bigger words. So what does it look like for a student that has dyslexia? Um, I've seen a lot of charts that list signs, but I thought this was interesting from Jan Hasbrook's latest book. So a, children might say, a child might say, I don't know any words that rhyme with cat. I don't know what you mean when you say what sounds are in the word brush. You know, I'm not sure how many syllables are in my name. You know, I don't know what sounds are in the name in this are the same in bit or hit. And I know the words I want to say, but they won't come out right. So this, this is what a child might perceive. Katie, I have one other question before you go on, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, it says, how can you tell if a child needs mastery or curriculum when working with something, uh, a program like Orton Gilliam? Well, um, a program like Orton Gilliam is mastery based. So when, I, and the training we have at the dyslexia centers, Orton Gillingham based, kind of expanded more than just the Orton Gillingham, but 
as a practitioner, what I do for my students is I will keep whatever they need to continue to work on in my rotation. So when I'm doing review work, and I really want them to have mastered that sound because you can see from that example of the 80% and even the 95% of being able to decode words, how that can impact the student. Um, I have one student right now I'm working on who is struggling with the voiced and unvoiced sounds for V and F, so V and F. So he'll replace those while reading and while spelling. So I can keep those in my lessons and still move forward. You know, I can keep that in the rotation. I hope that helps answer your uh yeah, thank you for that. And I, there is one other question, but I don't know if you'll be um, sort of touching on this at another time, but I'll read it to you and then you can decide where it fits in. Um, the question is, a person is interested in hearing about the types of accommodations that are appropriate for high school aged children with dyslexia. Yes, and I will, I will touch on that later. Okay, great. So I will come back around to that. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, um, so what a, what a parent might see, so this is interesting because I had the child's perspective, their frustrations. Now what a parent might see is um, not interested in reading, they might read quickly and skip over non-content words, and the to, for, from, they just skip over them. Um, another thing is reading really quickly and skipping over words, sounds, or not pausing for sentences little interest in rhyme. Um, a teacher might recognize, again, that they can't substitute sounds, um, like say mate, mate, and you change the cur, change that m to cur, and you'd have crate. So students really need to be able to manipulate the sounds. Another thing that I notice often is substituting voice for unvoiced sounds like the V for F, so V, and then the T for D, T, D. So transposing the sounds, but there's a there's a reason that they're substituting those sounds. It's because they they're not working through the voiced and unvoiced sounds, rhyming, syllabication, that kind of thing. Um, Struggling readers at daycares, late to talk. A lot of these children are referred to birth to three or speech. Um, they might appear distracted. My daughter appeared completely uninterested in 4K. Um, and it was just because she she couldn't do the activity. She couldn't do the rhyming. She didn't want to listen to Dr. Seuss. It was difficult to understand. Um, difficulty sequencing letters and numbers. And then once you hit the middle and high school levels, things become more noticeable because the, the, um, you learn from, you go from learning to read to reading to learn. So you, the assignments become more, the amount of information that needs to be read becomes more and more. So you'll, in the middle and high school years, you'll see poor spelling. Um, difficulty decoding, word identification, you know, possibly would show up as a comprehension, um, you know, a statewide iReady or um, STAR or Ames Web, whatever test that you're using assessment. Um, trouble with accurate or fluent word recognition and a ten tendency just to avoid reading and to read less which can also lead to some behavioral um, issues. So support for our struggling readers. Early identification is key. And I know that there's a lot of, there were, schools did assessments this fall. So parents should ask to see those assessments and then talk with the teachers about what the assessments mean for your student. Intervention and remediation with an effective science-based literacy instruction. There's quite a few out there. So <laughs> I think I listed some at the end. Um, you can support language development by reading engaging books aloud together. 
you can discuss text and vocabulary. Um, number one for students and struggling readers, students with dyslexia, is to get the intervention and remediation. Now schools do have, and I can list a couple of programs, you know, they're using Wilson or Sande or um, any of those other programs, but I would just make sure that all the teachers um, that are using them are trained and also using them with fidelity. So if, and I'm not exactly sure if this is right, but so for example, if Sande says 40 minutes a day, four days a week, then make sure your student's getting 40 minutes a day, four days a week. So that needs to be done with fidelity. So that would be number one would be to get remediation and support. And number two would be ensuring grade level content. Grade level content is just critical for students at every age. So the illustration I have over here on the right is was in the Discover magazine and audiobooks are reading to our brains, it doesn't matter. So the top image is listening to an audiobook, and the bottom image is reading a book. So you're activating the same part of your, your brain. Um, talk. So if you think you have a struggling reader, talk with your student's teacher, ask to see their assessments. Um, Something you can do without even a 504 or an IEP is ask the school what support they have for universal design and learning. A lot of schools um, have a plan in place, and that plan may actually include things like Google Read and Write or other assistive technology where they've actually purchased like a bundle of licenses, and those are available to all students. You don't need to have a 504 or an IEP. So that you can ask for right away if you have a struggling reader because they need to be able to access their content level materials. Um, and then also request in writing an evaluation for a suspected learning disability from the school. Definitely in writing and follow up. Schools are required by federal IDEA law to find children who are su suspected of having a condition where they would need special educational services. And DPI has recently, I mean, just <laughs> this just came out, so it's not in my slide. Um, they just issued a notification that they're looking at changing rules to the specific learning disability um, to qualify for a specific learning disability which a specific learning disability in reading would be dyslexia. So if you're looking for something at DPI and then you're not finding a lot on dyslexia, specific learning disability. So any program needs to include these components. It needs to be, instruction needs to be presented in a direct, explicit, systematic, sequential, and cumulative way. So that could mean order of frequency. So you would start with higher frequency sounds, but they, it would be taught in an explicit manner. Every scope and sequence doesn't have to be the same. So phonology would be study of sounds, like bat. What's the second sound in bat? Ah. Okay, sound symbol association letter to sound, syllable instruction, the six syllable types. Um, I think some people have added a couple of other syllable types. We say there's six. Morphology, suffixes, roots, prefixes, um, like the word periscope. You know, peri means around or surrounding, and scope means to view or see. And you can break those words apart. Syntax, grammar, how do sentences come together? And also semantics, meaning, so discussing meaning. So whatever program is being used, it should incorporate all of these things. Um, Wisconsin DPI doesn't currently have a list of approved curriculum that teaches um, 
they don't have an approved list that teaches in that manner that I could find. Other states, um, their State Board of Education have put out an approved list. Arizona has a really great list. Um, Arkansas has a good list. But he, what we do have in Wisconsin is we have a list from the Wisconsin IDA, and here's their accredited training programs. Um, the Children's Dyslexia Center is IMSLIC certified, so International Multisensory Structured Literacy Education Council certified. So this is a, kind of a lot to take in. A lot of different states have invested in letters, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. So you may have heard of some of these programs. I'm hopeful at some point DPI will um, look at some of these curriculums and trainings and maybe provide some guidance. That would be really great. All right, somebody had asked about accommodation. So um, I would say number one for accommodations would be getting assistive technology help, especially for a student in the upper grades. So why would they need assistive technology help? They need to be able to access their grade level content the same as their peers. They need to be able to work independently. When they can work independently, it boosts their self-esteem and then they can participate fully in class. The major thing that I'm finding is that you are able to get a lot of assistive, assistive technology help free, um, but the problem is they don't offer everything that a student with dyslexia would need. For instance, um, I believe it's Google will do the the speech to text and then like Microsoft Edge will do the text to speech. So one of those programs does one and the other program does the other. So imagine, you know, being a student with dyslexia and you're trying to find a free program and you have to switch back and forth between browsers or you have to switch back and forth between programs or if the program you find that's free isn't compatible with what especially in the learn in the virtual learning right now that we're doing if the product that your student found for free isn't compatible with what they're learning in class so they can really struggle there so when you're requesting assistive technology i would definitely make sure that you have a program that will do both text to speech and speech to text and not only that that it's compatible with whatever program the school's using um, a lot of schools are using Google Classroom and uh, Google Read and Write, the full paid version, will do text to speech and speech to text. Um, and it, that's been a great product for my daughter. She, they use all the features of Google. Um, Google Docs, Google Slides, Jamboard. Um, we were really happy that Google Read and Write worked in Jamboard because Jamboard's just a bunch of random post-its and that can be kind of hard <laughs> it can be hard for them to see and to read those um i know there's other products out there i'm just talking about the ones that we've used but just make sure that they're compatible with whatever the school is using um also make sure they have access to audiobooks audiobooks for fun reading um the other accommodation i would definitely get would be um either well if you're doing an online class online classes have been great for my eighth grader because the teachers will record the class and then she can go back and rewatch them and that's been great she's done that every week she's gone back and rewatched the classes um but if you're in a classroom setting i would have it so that the child had all those classroom materials available to review depending you know however the teacher does it if they have a powerpoint or if they have printed materials the student with dyslexia it might take them a little bit longer even if um, they don't struggle so much with decoding it may take them more time so i would definitely make sure they have access to classroom materials 
Um, so Learning Ally is what my children prefer for audiobooks. It is a paid subscription, but a lot of schools in Wisconsin contract with Learning Ally, so you should be able to get that through your school. I know a couple of students at um, in the Madison School District have used Learning Ally. Um, so the the fiction books are professionally read, but they also have textbooks. So you may be able to have your textbooks available in audio format. So I hope that helps answer the question. So, so we have our... Sorry, Katie, I have one other question that goes along with some of the things that you were just talking as far as accommodations are concerned. And this parent was saying, or teacher was saying that um, this per, uh, my student is offered accommodation, but doesn't feel that he needs to use them. What's your suggestion for encouragement here? Oh, as in they, they probably need it, but they don't, they don't want to access the accommodation. Like, Hmm, I guess I'm confused. So they I think, have the accommodation, but they don't want to use it. Right. How can you encourage a student who is kind of negative to using accommodations to show them that it's important for them to use these accommodations to be able to help them in a positive manner? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, because when you get these students that are older, it's more difficult for them to ask for help. Um, like. My daughter didn't want to use some of the accommodations either. Once I showed her how she could use them and we kind of walked through and then we talked about how she could use them in class, she felt more confident and then she started using them. So I would maybe talk with the student and ask, are they comfortable using them? Um, do they understand how to use them? And maybe walk beside them and then just show them how they could use it. So it might be, it might be a few different um, reasons, but I, I find if you kind of model for them how to use it, that might be a good way to help. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So our exciting news for 2020 in February was the Dyslexia Guidebook Advisory Committee was signed into law by Governor Evers, becoming Act 86. Um, it's going this guidebook is going to cover screening processes and tools to identify students with dyslexia and related conditions the second thing is to provide interventions and instructional strategies to improve academic performance and the third thing is to supply resources and services related to dyslexia and other conditions so other conditions with dyslexia might include um, dyslexia so we have dyslexia Dis, um, difficulty, lexia, reading, and then we also have dysgraphia. Dysgraphia would be a difficulty writing, not only just a difficulty with writing, but also written expression. Sometimes that's left out. It may look like poor handwriting, or in the beginning it may look like poor handwriting, but it's more of a condition of um, getting out your written expression. And then also dyscalculia would be um, difficulty with math calculations. So I'm hopeful that all of, all of those will be covered in the guidebook. Um, so the they have started meeting and the next public meeting is November 5th, 2020. And if you have the notes, you should be able to click on the link or you could just Google uh, Wisconsin DPI dyslexia guidebook and you have, they have, created a website. So I would bookmark that website if you're looking for updates. And the publication date for the guidebook is December 2021. So through all of this, our ultimate goal is to encourage children and foster success. And I think Dr. Dyslexia Dude summed it up at the end of his most recent graphic novel with this. The journey may be long, but stay encouraged and hopeful and you too can succeed. So this is the second, this is his second graphic novel, but 
that's what kids need. You know, they need courage, hope, and they need to have repeated success. And we can help them do that. And I'm pretty excited about this guidebook because um, students and teachers in Wisconsin could use some guidance when it comes to um, supporting students. So I've also listed in the PowerPoint some resources and groups. If you're a parent, you should check out the University of Wisconsin, sign up for our newsletter. Um, we also have the Children's Dyslexia Centers. There's a Wisconsin Learning Disability Network. Again, here's the link for the Wisconsin Dyslexia Guidebook. Um, another great thing to subscribe to is the Science of Reading podcast. There's all sorts of topics on there, some really, really great stuff. Dr. Dyslexia Dude um, has a blog, so he's offering encouragement. Sometimes he has guest bloggers to encourage um, parents and students. Uh, Katie Fortune, she also, she's an adult with dyslexia in Wisconsin and she has a motivational podcast. Um, if you're an educator, feel free to subscribe to any and all of the parent side, but you should also maybe check into the International Dyslexia Association, Wisconsin branch. The Reading League, Wisconsin chapter is really starting to take off. Um, there's the Reading League National, they offer quite a few trainings throughout the year and they're they're geared towards teachers so i would really check that out um check more into the wisconsin dpi universal design and learning if you're an educator and you haven't thought about using universal design and learning um in this manner then maybe see if your school would be interested in getting other ways for students to access text another uh great group is the science of reading which i what i wish i had learned in college facebook group and also the science of reading info.com so that's a newer website and that was um developed by donna Hamenic, who also started that facebook group but if you're an educator i would really encourage you to check that out there's all sorts of training on there and it's by module and it's by topic and there's free webinars there's a lot of information on there so i highly recommend it Again, the guidebook, advisory guidebook, and also the science of reading. So Katie, I have a question that's related to like some of these resources and um, it would be your opinion about how to do it. Um, this person asked, I'm not sure that teachers are aware of a lot of the accommodations and resources available or how to use them. Um, maybe making a copy of this page and handing it to them might be a suggestion or do you have other suggestions yeah you could do that um there is actually a department at dpi that specializes in assistive technology and apparently they will do training for school districts and i'm sorry i don't have the link for that i'd have to ask um, my friend lacretia who does a lot of assistive technology training um, but there is actually a department at the Department of Instruction that handles specifically assistive technology. But yeah, you, I think printing that off would be a a good start, and then maybe ask them what what else they would suggest. Okay, thank you. Okay, and some other resources. I like visuals um this book i can't read by william manzarnes is um he's an adult who grew up with dyslexia um, a native american from i believe washington state and it's a really interesting read so i would recommend his book i can't read um also conquering dyslexia is a newer book and the reason i put that one on here i i really like I, uh, I had been asked to kind of preview it and I wasn't too excited about reading another textbook, but then I got it and it was divided out into chapters and it was really well um, segment, segmented so you could look up whatever topic you wanted. So there's things in here for parents and teachers in Conquering Dyslexia. Um, Dr. Dyslexia, I do highly recommend his graphic novels, especially with students. I read 
his uh, graphic novels with all of my students. Marianne Wolf, she has some great books on dyslexia and reading. The Knowledge Gap, Natalie Wexler, kind of, that was the book everybody was reading last summer. So if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend that book. Um, the Science of Reading podcast, like I said, there is a lot of good information on there. And I believe they started the podcast, I don't know, almost a year ago. So if you haven't been there yet, I would check it out. The Reading League Wisconsin or the National Reading League. The National Reading League publishes, I think it's a quarterly um, magazine, and it's just chock full of research for teachers. So if you go to the Reading League, you should subscribe to their, their, um, their magazine, their publication. Um, resources for students who have dyslexia, if you're looking for tutoring, the Children's Dyslexia Centers, there's one in Madison, Milwaukee, Eau Claire, Eau Claire has a satellite up in the Superior area. Um, another great local resource is Mark Seidenberg, Language at the Speed of Sight. Um, if you're a teacher and you're looking for ways to inc incorporate multi-sensory teaching in your classroom, this book by Judith Birch, Multi-Sensory Teaching of Basic Language Skills, um, is what we use at the Dyslexia Center and a lot of other uh, Orton Gillingham based trainings use that book. Uh, the Science of Reading Info, if you can see at the top of that graphic, there's topics one, two, three, four. So if you go to that web page and you drop down, you can find training on whatever topic you're looking for. There's just so many resources on that page. If you're specifically looking for phonemic awareness skills with your students, I would recommend Hagerty has um, phonemic awareness skills broken down by grade level, which you could do with your entire classroom. I would highly recommend it. And then Kilpatrick equipped, sorry, it cut off the top, is equipped for reading success. And he has phonemic awareness skills, which um, I would use more as a tutor because you can do them one-on-one. -on -one. They're kind of more specialized. Hagerty would be more of a classroom. You probably could use Kilpatrick for the full classroom, but um, it's not laid out in a weekly manner like Hagerty is. All right, I think that's the end. Did we have any more questions, Bonnie? Um, actually, I just have one that just came through, so let me see if I can, oh, actually two. Um, Carroll University is developing a structured literacy micro-credential program for teachers, and it'll launch in January of 2021. Um, so that's some informational stuff to pass on. And then the next one says, what tutoring opportunities are available for my child? Um, as um, we do not live close to the Children's Dyslexia Center that's listed. So I did know about the course at Carroll College. I've actually been talking to some professors there. Pretty, It's pretty exciting. I'm really excited. We'll announce that when we have more information. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and then as far as tutoring opportunities, you know, one of the, the ways that students with dyslexia have actually benefited I think, from COVID is that a lot of us have been forced uh, to tutor online remotely. So, you know, if you have the ability to pay for a tutor, there are tutors available that are doing online tutoring, first off. And also second off, I, you know, this might open the doorway for the dyslexia centers to provide some online tutoring in the future. You know, we don't know what opportunities there might be. So I hear you though. I mean, the dyslexia centers are great, but they are really spread out. And so it is hard for a lot of people to access them. So if you, whoever asked the question, if you would like to contact Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin for more information, we could forward you more information or look at our website. Because there are quite a few tutors who are tutoring online, but I would maybe contact one of the dyslexia centers and see if they're going to continue online tutoring. 
Okay, thank you. And that's the end of our question. So Katie, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? Because we're right at the one o'clock hour. No, I just want to thank you so much for having me, Bonnie. And thank you for everybody for listening in today. Spread the word that October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Katie for her great presentation today, which was filled with lots of great resource information. And I'd like to let everybody know that this concludes our webinar for today. We'd like to thank you all for joining us. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has lots of training still available for the year 2020 and that we are in the process of listing our training calendar for 2021. So please have an opportunity to take a look at the training calendar and please sign up for any of those trainings that might be of interest to you. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming your way after today's live presentation. Have a great day, everybody. And again, Katie, thank you very much for your presentation. Bye, everybody.